it open my heart to the joy of pain and living as you love may you love in receiving and in giving spirit open my heart god replace my story Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. This is not my favorite means of uh, bringing forth a worship service virtually. However, uh, we do what we have to do for us all to be safe. So welcome. I'm really pleased that you joined us online this morning. Uh, I was rather disappointed, of course, when I learned that we were going to not be in person, because as many of you know, I've been away from the pulpit for a few months, and uh, I was to be back last Sunday, but unfortunately I was ill, and uh, I thank, uh, thank Reverend Brian for doing that service, but I was looking forward to, to meeting many of you here this morning. However, uh, I do have a couple here with us, uh, Tom and, and Don, who are going to sort of uh, be a part of the congregation. Uh, as you are aware, we, uh, we are very uh, responsive, do responsive, speak responsively in worship, so they are going to, to do those voices for us this morning that you would do if you were here in worship. So I say thank you to them. Also, a thank you to Victoria, who was going to be bringing forth the music this morning. We uh, really appreciate that. And a thank you to Heather for, for doing the camera work today. So there is one announcement that uh, Judy has asked me to make, and that is uh, annual reports are due. And as soon as possible, would you please uh, send your report to her? And also, uh, uh, if you have a candle with you at home, wherever you are, and you wish to light a candle with me, uh, this is something we do, of course, each Sunday we light a candle, and it serves as a focus for us and also uh, a sense of connection will be there. So I would invite you to, to light one today if you, if you have one. And we acknowledge the land as a, a means of, uh, to show our gratitude and to indicate our desire for reconciliation. So I will acknowledge the land. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked in this land on their own country their relationship with their land is at the center of their lives. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Maliseet and the Mi'kmaq people, and we acknowledge their relationship of this land throughout the ages. We 
As we light our candle, we are reminded that our, in our church calendar, we are in the season of epiphany, or the season of light. Epiphany meaning revelation or manifestation. So over the next few weeks, uh, our biblical stories will uh, be meant to share a light on who this Jesus was. So today we light this candle uh, to acknowledge the presence of the living Christ with us. Acknowledge Jesus Christ as the light of the world, and may the light of God's love and hope shine through each one of us. We move to the call to awareness. Let us acknowledge the awesome mystery embodied in every person. Through us, God comes to a unique and personal expression. Let us give thanks for the abundance of life on this earth. Through it, we and all people may be nourished. We come to have our spirits refreshed and our faculties stirred. Strengthen us with courage. May we be open to the presence of the Spirit as we gather together this morning for worship. Come, let us worship. Amen. In 
our service of worship, we often take this time for either a key scripture verse or a thought for the day. So today I am bringing forth um, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., an American clergyman, an activist, prominent in the American Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. And if we were living in the United States, tomorrow would be a national holiday uh, because we, they observe uh, Dr. King's birthday, which is on January 15th. So I just wanted us to uh, hear a couple of the um, quotes from, from Dr. King. Not the racist segregation of a Birmingham jail, nor his bloody martyrdom on a Memphis motel balcony could shape Dr. King's fidelity to Christ's message of love. The memorial, imp, immortal words inscribed on his memorial put a gentle message powerfully. And let us hear those words. Hatred paralyzes life. Love releases it. Hatred confuses life. Love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens life. Love illuminates it. What a legacy to take home to glory. A life laid down in Christ as a witness to his enduring love. What a gift of brilliant insight and articulation on bonds closer than brotherhood. We are one, the beloved of God, united in the body of Christ. Dr. King's gift is the gift that keeps on giving. For more than 40 years, it has guided our sense of civil justice. When and if that necessity ever fades, there is a more enduring lesson he left us that transcends deceptions of pigmentation and DNA. In Valedictory, he summarized the power of truth, love, and our human condition. Hear his words. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That is why I write Temporary defeated it is stronger than an evil triumphant. Amen. So we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves and to each other and to God that we do not always let the light of God's love and hope show through us. In this time of opening our hearts, let us remember that God is merciful and just and eager to offer grace and love. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. Creator God, we have been given a variety of gifts and a variety of services, but they are all the work of your spirit. Forgive us when we do not recognize or acknowledge our talents and gifts. Forgive us when we do not use our gifts in your service. Open us to the work we ought to do. Open us to your spirit working in us. And hear now our song of confession. Amen. Let us hear the words of affirmation. Our Creator takes delight in us and rejoices over us. God's limited love has the power to turn troubled waters of resentment and fear into the wine of grace. Let us receive and celebrate this good news. Amen. bids us shine with a pure clear light like a little candle burning in the night in this world is darkness so oh, let us shine you in your smoke my lord and i in mine jesus bids us shine first of all for him well he sees and knows it if our light grows dim Jesus. 
Jesus walks beside us to help us shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. Jesus bids us shine then for all around. Many kinds of darkness in the world are found. Sin and want and sorrow, so we must shine. You in your small corner and I When we gather together as a community of faith, we affirm our faith in the words of the new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discernment of spirits. To another various kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. Thus ends the reading of the first lesson. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the, the Gospel of John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11 and we're going to bring it to you in story form dialogue uh, Tom and I and we have a little a brief introduction to the scripture as well today the story is about the time Jesus turned the water into wine and this puzzles me because I can remember when most churches were dead as dead against alcohol ever under any circumstances. It wasn't that long ago when alcoholic drinks of any kind were outlawed in many parts of the world. And it was the churches that were most against it. So how can we reconcile that and this story? Here, right near the beginning of John's Gospel, Jesus' very first miracle was to keep the party going. Social change. Who knows how it happened? So I can't really answer your question. When we were looking at the scripture earlier, you were giggling about Mary, Jesus' mother. What did you find so funny? Well, she is the typical mother, isn't she? They run out of wine, 
And she goes to Jesus with the problem. Jesus snaps at her and basically tells her to get cooler. He's not ready to do his magic act. She ignores him and tells the steward just to do what Jesus tells him. You can almost feel her giving Jesus a good, stern, motherly look. And we all know that look. But of course, he does what his mama tells him. He makes the wine. But not just wine, but the very best wine ever. Even though most of the folks at the wedding reception were already too sloshed to know the difference. So let's read the story. It's from the second chapter of John's Gospel. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus spoke to him. They have no wine. Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. Hey, servant, do whatever Jesus tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification. Each one of those jars would hold 20 or 30 gallons. So Jesus spoke to the servant. Fill the jars with water. Which is what they did. They filled them up to the brim. Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took the wine to the steward who tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew then the steward called to the bridegroom. Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Canaan of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. So friends, the reading of the gospel. May we find some wisdom for our living in these words from sacred scripture.
The title of my message this morning is Extravagant Love. No doubt some of you will remember the American late night talk show that was aired in the 60s and up until early 90s, hosted by Johnny Carson. Many years ago, he interviewed an eight-year-old boy. I don't think it was on the late night show. It must have been another venue. The youngster was asked to appear because he had rescued two friends in a coal mine outside his hometown in West Virginia. As Johnny questioned the boy, it became apparent to him and also to the audience that the young boy was a Christian. So Johnny asked him if he attended Sunday school. When the boy said he did, Johnny inquired, what are you learning in Sunday school? Well, last week, he said, our lesson was about Jesus who went to a wedding and turned the water into wine. Well, the audience roared in laughter, but Johnny tried to keep a straight face. And then he said to him, and what did you learn from the story? And the boy squirmed in his chair and he, it was obvious that he hadn't thought about an answer before. And he came up with this answer. He said, if you're going to have a wedding, make sure you invite Jesus. The little boy was on to something. And the question might very well be asked of us. What did we learn from the story of Jesus at the wedding in Cana? Again, this is one of those all too familiar Bible stories. Even many non-churchgoers will cite like content from this story. Why might that be? Is it the miraculous component? It's one of those stories that we use quite often half jokingly when we want to see something extraordinary happen to us or to others. This week's gospel lesson tells a story of a holy encounter at a wedding and it offers us an opportunity to explore a story of miracle. In this story, and others like it, faith does not call us to settle on a mutually agreeable decision of, did it happen that way or not? I have often said when reading those miracle stories that what is important is not whether one takes the story literally, or metaphorically, but whether one takes it seriously. What can we learn from the story? That is, can we listen to and through the story to, to, uh, to see what is being revealed about God and about us? Where and in what way have we experienced the extravagance of God's love for us and for all of creation. How might we celebrate God's extravagant love this week? After lecturing on miracles, a great theologian was asked to give a specific example of one. And he thought for a moment, he said, there's only one miracle. And what is it? It is life. He went on to pose the following questions to his students. Have you ever wept at anything this past year? Has your heart beat faster at the sight of young beauty? Have you thought seriously about the fact that someday you were going to die? More often than not, do you really listen when people are speaking to you instead of waiting for your turn to speak? And the last question he asked, is there anybody you would you know in whose place, if one had to suffer great pain, that you would volunteer yourself? He went on to say, if your answer to all or most of these questions is no, the chances are you're dead. It's important to note that unlike many of the stories of Jesus, this story of Jesus at the wedding in Canaan is told only in John's Gospel and not by any of the other three Gospel writers. Also in John's Gospel, 
Jesus' actions are portrayed as and not as miracles, but as signs. The last verse in the reading this morning, verse 11, we hear these words. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed. The signs are revelations or epiphanies of who God is and what God is doing in the person of Jesus the Christ. It also shows us how our lives can be transformed from ordinary and routine to lively, spirit-filled ones, full of zest and sparkle. In this text, as well as other stories, we see Jesus as the one who enjoyed life to the fullest, attending weddings, laughing with his friends, as well as reaching out to help the family whose wine had run out. When we help others, God's glory is revealed. But it is also revealed in our attitude to life. The joy and generosity of spirit with which we encounter the world around us. One of the great second century Christian theologians, Irenaeus, recognized by the Roman Catholic Church as Saint Irenaeus, once said, and I quote, the glory of God is people fully alive. What better way to understand the meaning of the glory of God than to recognize it as people who are fully alive. The Spirit of God reflected in a person. No doubt all of us can name people within our lives or people in history who have reflected God's glory in the living of their lives and some even in their death. Before us, there are people who have already put forth all so that they could live in a world filled with more peace and less hatred. And though evil still lives, these people knocked a huge dent in our fight for equality. Some of these men and women and even children paid the ultimate price for their freedom, the freedom of their generation and the freedom for generations to come. Among the countless humans, of all races and creeds that worked tirelessly for equality was a man who was determined to make changes in a nonviolent way, the man who we spoke of earlier in the service, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday was celebrated on January 15th. Even though evil took Dr. King's life away, his message was one of peace, togetherness, and service. This is a message that should never be forgotten. May his legacy live on forever. It is clear that there is much more needed to be done for equality, which comes to us through the Black Lives Matter movement. May we remember God's glory was revealed in Dr. King's passion and his faith as he worked to transform this world. And remember that we too are called to be an epiphany. We too are called to show forth God's world, God's glory in our world. But how do we do that? Perhaps one of the ways that might show forth God's glory or one of the ways that we could reveal who God or Jesus is it would be by using our God-given gifts and our talents the Creator has bestowed on us for the benefit of all. For Paul, writing to the Corinthians, God is revealed by the Spirit in the diverse community of the Church at Corinth. Today's passage was written in response to a problem in that community of faith. The church experienced a great diversity of spiritual gifts, and this caused confusion. Perhaps not all of the gifts 
were equally valued. Perhaps the Corinthians were not certain that the gifts came from a single source. Paul writes to assure them that a variety of gifts comes from a single source for a common purpose. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. No one is greater than any other, for it's the same God working in all of us. It is in looking at all people that one is able to glimpse. I'm sorry, it is looking at, at it is in looking at all people that one is able to glimpse the incredible richness of God. No one member of the Christian community at Corinth or in our community could reveal what God was like. But in the diverse gifts of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracle working, prophecy, discernment, various kinds of tongues and interpretation, it is in and through the manifestation of these gifts within a community of faith where God is seen. The community of faith becomes an epiphany, a revelation of God, as God is manifest in people. The epistle attest, the epistle lesson attests to the abundance of spirit-given gifts and services provided to the followers of Christ. The author reminds us that each follower has a specific set of gifts which differ from others and that these gifts are poured out upon all for the sake of the common good, not for individual desires. This week's lessons, readings, invite us to trust in God, trust in God who provides abundantly for life's needs. Jesus embodied extravagance, and it's in the spirit of extravagance that it's so important for us to proclaim in our lives, day in and day out, that everyone will know the spirit of a living God and the living Christ is alive and well today. Water into wine is the transformation God holds out to all of us within our lives, the creative and imaginative change which God can offer, only God can offer. What might happen in this community of faith and in this community at large if we but allow God's Spirit to fill us to overflowing with these diverse gifts of abundance and extravagance? May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Like empty stone jars, Creator filled us with goodness and grace. By the Spirit, may we be poured out into a world that needs so much God's love and holy presence. Be with those this day who still feel empty and broken, standing all alone. Let your love flow to those thirsty for acceptance and a new beginning. Give us a willingness to ask for big gifts, not small ones. Gifts like peace and love and justice. In our discipleship, tempt us to try larger tasks, great ventures, and remarkable feats. We pray that our watered-down faith may be changed into the deep water of faithful discipleship, the deep wine of faithful discipleship. Amen.
So there are different ways to offer our monetary gifts. Um, when we're here in worship, of course, we have an offering plate at the back, but if you're not in person, I know many of you give by free authorized remittance, and uh, you'll also be given to e-transfer or drop off your offering at the church, or you can also mail your offering. So we, sh we will offer some words of dedication for these gifts. Let us pray. Generous God, through all our years, let the church be a place where we can learn to love and practice it, where we envision peace and work to build it, where we meet our partners in faith and cherish them, where we discover our gifts and offer them, Accept the monetary gifts we bring and the gifts of our lives. Amen. Our prayer for the people this morning uh, come from, I have adapted this prayer from Roy Royer, I'm sorry, Todd Royer. Uh, he was inspired by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous speech, I Have a Dream, and he, he, he uh, Compose this prayer, which I will read, adapted to this morning. Let us pray. God of dreams and dreamers, in dreams he brought good news to Mary and to Joseph and warned the Magi of danger. Today you have given us a dream. We have a dream that one day all people will rise up and come to see that they were created so, to live together as sisters and brothers in human community. We have a dream that one day every person in this country will be judged on their character rather than on their skin color, and that every person will respect the dignity and the worth of the other. We have a dream that the idle industries of our country will be revitalized that empty stomachs will be filled, and that human community will be more than a few words at the end of a prayer, but rather the first order of business on every agenda. We have a dream that one day justice will flow down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We have a dream that one day all those who fill elected officers in our country will do so with justice, with will love kindness, and will seek to walk humbly with their God. We have a dream that one day we will come to an end, that people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into cooties or hooks, that nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they study war anymore. We have a dream that one day the wolf shall lie with the lamb, and that none shall be afraid. God of dreams and dreamers, send your Holy Spirit upon us, that one day our dreams may come to fruition, and the whole earth will know your glory. May each one of us be empowered by the Spirit to use our gifts and our talents for the common good of all, to help to bring these dreams to fruition. We offer our prayers this morning on behalf of all those who are sick, those who grieve, in all those places where life is difficult, especially as a result of COVID in conflicts and wars and oppression, natural disasters. Accept, assured of our listening presence, we offer all of our prayers in the name of the one who teaches us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For 
thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. I leave us with this commissioning and benediction. Beloved of God, may we go into the world that God loves to bless it with our imagination, to transform it with our courage, to renew it with our compassion, and may the Spirit's presence fill us with abundant hope and everlasting joy. Amen. Ha! Uh -huh.